Did this woman really see a burning house in this empty field? Was she witness to a tragedy yet to happen? There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever as to what we saw. And did this man see back in time to glimpse a vision of the past? And why did this Arctic explorer map a land that never was? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communications satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. This is the oldest government department in Sri Lanka, the survey set up by the British in 1800. It still keeps to some of the empire's traditions. For example, the boss is called the Surveyor General, but otherwise it's a thoroughly modern place, using satellite imagery to make maps of every feature in this island of 65,000 square kilometers. Thanks to survey departments like this one, we should now have an accurate picture of the entire planet. But do we? Because travelers are reporting on eerie phenomenon. They say that buildings they spot from a distance turn out not to be there. Sometimes they discover that the building was demolished years before. Sometimes it never existed at all. Such tales seem weird, even preposterous, but I take them seriously when they come from reputable observers. This wild and uninhabited glen in the highlands of Scotland is one of Europe's loneliest places. It's accessible only by boat, helicopter, or the most determined of hill walkers. George Bruce and Donald Watt are both members of mountain rescue teams. They are intrepid climbers and know the moods of the mountains. I've been walking for about 40 years in the Scottish Highlands, and with George here, we've been doing uh, 30 years together in all kinds of conditions, day and night, in winter and summer, all year round. We don't imagine we're seeing things. What we see, we know we're seeing. The last time they came down the slopes of Ben Finlay, the friends were on the first stage of a weekend hike. The day was beautiful. It was the 3rd of May, alpine-type conditions. The sky was pure blue. A bit of snow on the ground, visibility was absolutely fantastic. The two planned to shelter in a ruined house further up the valley, but to their surprise, they spotted another building first. I was about 100 yards behind George up the hill, and I saw this cottage before George stopped, and then he stopped ahead of me, and I got down to him, and he turned to me and said, it's a cottage down there, I said, yeah, I see it. So, I mean, we both saw the same thing, but we saw it quite a bit apart. The cottage was in clear view at the water's edge, but it was not on the map. The thing that struck me was there was no moss or anything on the roof. Normally in these, these cottages, the slates would attract some moisture, be a bit of moss, and it would look worn a bit. This thing wasn't worn. The, the sun was reflecting off the slates, and it was almost as though it had been, well, either in a good scrub to clean it up or freshly built. So we just kept going down. I went into a kind of little gully system and lost sight of it, right down to the lock side, walked around the path, anticipating this cottage, and there was nothing there. The house had vanished. George and Donald were mystified. Both were completely certain that they had seen a real building from above. Oh, I know exactly what I saw. It was solid, uh, sitting on the side of the loch, on solid ground, with solid ground behind it and all around about it. Two windows in the bottom, two dormer windows in the top, two chimneys, no smoke, I'm afraid, but very new looking. Where we're standing now, here, is where we think we saw it. Uh, it's very strange again. I, I remember vividly eight years ago doing exactly what I'm doing now, standing here. We walked about here, totally puzzled, walked right onto the end so we could see right down the loch, no cottage. 
and I feel somewhat similar just now. I'm still surprised it's not sitting here. I think it should be sitting here. And maybe someday I'll come back in the distant future and it will be sitting here, I hope. Yeah, it's a strange feeling. Only 60 miles north, Susanna Stone believes she too may have had a brief glimpse of the future. Come on, come on. It happened one evening as she drove a friend home after dinner. We drove along this April evening, peacefully, lovely evening, a light evening, and we came round the church, and to our horror, we saw a largish house, high house, uh, blazing, flaming. I mean, the flames were coming out of all the windows, the upstairs and the downstairs, and curling up the lintels. Susanna knew the road like the back of her hand. She had driven up and down it every week for years. We stopped the van and we uh, turned off the engine and we watched it. It had long narrow Georgian windows, which are quite different to any of the other houses around here. And it um, had a long, narrow door in the middle that was shut. The building Susanna saw was on the grass field beyond where the new road now runs. It stood just where the football goalposts are. The blazing house that we saw was just exactly there. And it was uh, very obvious, very clear, it was by itself, those wooden houses weren't there. Eerily, they heard no noise and saw no people. They wanted a closer look. So we set off and we got nearer to it and we went quite a distance down. I was driving, but she, she was watching and um, when we got quite near, it vanished, completely disappeared, it just simply wasn't there. So I thought, well, perhaps the, the levels had changed. Um, we may be lower down, and perhaps I'd got my angles wrong, and we couldn't see it. Susanna dropped her friend off and began the journey home. But close to the field where the two had seen the blazing house, she had a puncture. She had to walk to a telephone to call for help. As I walked on up the hill, I realized that there was something terribly wrong. It was something very strange. There was nothing in the field that i just walked past. And I'd looked into the field, and a few humps and bumps and, in it and some stones, but no house, no, no ashes, nothing. And so I thought, that's most extraordinary. I really felt quite frightened. I've often thought about this since, and it, and it worried me as I walked up the dark road as to what on earth we had seen, the two of us. And, um, I really don't know, but except that I have a feeling that it, perhaps it's the future. I, I just wonder, and if anyone ever builds a light-coloured house in, in that position, I'm not a bit sure what I'd do about it. I think I might have to go and knock on the door and warn them. Mount Low rises above the city of Los Angeles. It's a wilderness haven above the smog. At the turn of the century, the mountain was a popular tourist attraction. A railway took day trippers up for a breath of fresh air and lunch in the Alpine Tavern Hotel. The more adventurous could ascend to the very top and enjoy the panoramic views, thanks to Herbert the Mule. But even Los Angeles' favorite day out could not survive the economic depression of the 1930s. The resort closed, and now all that remains of the railway is a track for hikers. Beau Osjo is a keen walker. 
The first time I hiked to Mont Lowe was in the 1970s. And uh, I hiked from the bottom of the mountain, which is about four miles up here, I think. And I saw a, a huge building up here that looked like a hotel, uh, green in color. And I saw a maid was sweeping a big staircase. She was using a, an old fashioned broom, a hand broom, and nobody does that today. They use vacuum cleaners or uh, other tools, but so it looked. It looked kind of old-fashioned. Puzzled, Bo went down the mountain and described the hotel to a friend, Vaughan Thompson. An argument began. I told him. I said, there hadn't been any buildings up there in years. I knew there had been in a long time ago, but they burned down and, and they, they were just gone. I said to him, uh, this hotel is still standing on Mont Lowe. And he said, no way, there are no, no buildings on Mont Lowe. They haven't been in our lifetimes. And I say, yes, it, uh, yes, there is, because I've seen it. I, I certainly wasn't dreaming. This was reality. It was as real as anything can be. Although no one would believe him, Bo refused to budge from his story. He climbed the mountain again. This time, he went to the exact spot where he had seen the hotel standing. He found his friends had been right. There was only rubble. There was no building. There was just this empty structure uh, with high trees, and it was a very surprising situation. I am 100% sure the hotel was there. Uh, the cars came up right up to the front of the hotel. Brian Marcroft, a Mount Low Ranger, keeps a collection of old photographs. Amongst them, Bo recognizes his phantom hotel. There is one. That, that looks exactly like it. Gee, that's fascinating because, you know, it, uh, it burned in 36. Uh, uh -huh. The shell of it sat here for years, abandoned, and then in 1959, it, what was standing was dynamited to the ground. But that is the hotel, all right. Bo is certain he saw this hotel building almost 40 years after it was destroyed. Well, that was a very scary experience uh, because I questioned myself, what else have I seen that is not there? And it was with me for a long time when I was out hiking alone. Yeah. I always questioned myself, is that uh, for real or is it not? The people who report sightings of apparently phantom buildings are usually condemned to years of frustration without ever discovering what they really saw. Yet sometimes a little persistence, a fresh look and a bit of luck finally solve these mysteries. Here's one such case. Ironically, it comes from the city that thrives on confusing reality with illusion, a place where nothing is what it seems, Hollywood. USA. This woman is on her way to a meeting that she hopes will resolve a mystery that's been bothering her for years. Her date is with Larry Geldman. He is a movie actor with an interest in the paranormal. Shelley Lawrence used to be part of the Hollywood dream machine. One day near Paramount Studios, she found a little basement shop. For the first time, I saw a sign on one of the doors that said, Bookstore, step down. And I kind of After browsing for a while, Shirley turned to go, but was stopped by the shop owner. And she said, wait, I have something for you. Don't leave. And she disappeared through a door behind her desk. And she came back carrying this, and she handed it to me. This old tome called Ardith by Marie Corelli. Never read this one. Well, I took the book, and I said, why, thank you. What do I owe you for this? And she said, absolutely nothing, because she said, I think you're going to appreciate this book. Shirley loved the book. She looked forward to returning to the shop next time Paramount employed her talents. I wanted to thank this lady because I loved the book. So the next time I worked at Paramount, I went back to that bookstore. But it wasn't there. It was gone. A paranormal publication picked up Shirley's story. She believed the bookshop had been a phantom, but one reader knew better. From his own days at Paramount, Larry remembered exactly where it was. 
I was really amazed because uh, I'd been to that bookshop numerous times. I couldn't believe it. So I did go over and I prowled around, you know, like a good detective. And I found out that the signs hanging in front were gone, the window markings were gone, and a new man was downstairs, three, four steps down. So I went and talked to him and I said, are you running the bookshop? And I looked around, there weren't any books. He says, no, I'm an engineer. The bookshop had indeed vanished, but its disappearance was not paranormal. The building still stood, but an engineer's office had taken it over. If Shirley had looked harder, she would have discovered the truth. But now it's too late. You recognize any of that? Oh, how it has changed. Well, that's the same old gate, Paramount Pictures Gate. Yes. And the bookstore was just down, but there's nothing there. Paramount's expanding empire has engulfed the whole street. Benfleet Downs in Essex is the unlikely location for one of the most famous reports of phantom buildings in the annals of psychical research. This is the story of how investigator Melvin Harris believes he has cracked this long-standing puzzle. Earlier investigators, Bob and June Andrews, were told that two people had spotted an old house deep in these woods by the railway tracks. But it had never been seen again. One Sunday afternoon, they uh, were going along to their friends and they saw a what they thought was, was a large, imposing Georgian house from which ran a girl and a dog. They looked at this and they saw what they did later described as a gravel drive leading to the Georgian house. Then they went to their friends and said, we've just noticed this Georgian house on the way to see you, which we've never seen before. And their friends said, well, of course, there isn't one there at all. The couple lived locally and were asked by the Society for Psychical Research to look into the mystery and see if they could resolve it. We spent two evenings walking along together, uh, along the, the, the path, looking in all directions, and there was just literally nothing at all to be found. We went to the library, we asked relevant questions, we looked at maps that they had, such as they had. We then looked at these ordnance survey maps and the borough engineers. There was nothing there that they could have claimed to have been remotely like a Georgian house. The case was reported in the prestigious journal of the Society of Psychical Research. Bruce and Grace McMahon described the house they saw. They said they had searched the wood and had never found it again. Melvin Harris thinks the key to the mystery probably lies close to the scene of the sighting in the little local library at Hadley. It was a story that was cobbled together by two children. They talked about an imposing Georgian house. Well, the first thing I thought, well, most children don't know much about architecture. A Georgian house is maybe just a rough guess. So I'm not looking for an imposing Georgian house. I'm looking for a large house in the forest. Harris knew the Andrews had studied Ordnance Survey maps, but he thinks they had been given the wrong map by the wrong library. If you go to South End and ask for that large-scale Ordnance Survey maps, you'll see this map, and that map doesn't show the Bentley Downs in full. They really need to go on much further, and as you see on this map, the Downs start there, they go right across there, many inches, and in the middle of that wooded area, the path walked by the children, the Andrews, and in the centre of the wood is a small rectangle, which was a house. The map in Hadley Library showed a house called Ray View. The Andrews had missed it for two reasons. They had not been shown the full map of the Downs. Secondly, they had not been told that the original report had come from children. Well, they must have taken our friends to the wrong place. Oh, yes, they, they, they still went to the same road every yes, time. Yes, yes. Harris wants to show the Andrews Ray View and satisfy them that the story of the Phantom House grew from a series of simple misunderstandings. And you don't associate it from the railway track. It just looks like a house stuck yeah. on the edge. But the children were adamant that there was no house in the forest anywhere. Yes, yes. yes. And this is the point. They didn't say apart from Rayview, which is this house. And yet I always knew this house was here. And that's right. But people who know this house can't find it at times. Mm. Um, 
you know, they will come here, they will come for a visit, they will try to make a second visit to it, and they'll get lost. It's still a very mysterious place for a lot of people. Sometimes travelers claim they've seen not just one phantom building, but whole cities. For example, in 1915, Frank Worsley was captain of Sir Ernest Shackleton's polar exploration ship, Endurance. As he sailed along the Antarctic coast, he made this note in his log. Inshore appears a beautiful, dazzling city of cathedral spires, domes, and minarets. Well, as Worsley knew, the only buildings in the Antarctic at that time were a few wooden expedition huts. So, what was this fabulous but illusory city? I'm glad to say that sightings of this kind can be explained by science. The Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge houses mementos from polar exploration over centuries. Besides artifacts of icy adventures, it preserves travellers' tales of distant lands reported by explorers. Dr Gareth Rees has discovered that not all of the stories have stood the test of time. I think we can say that if all of these reports were true, which we now disbelieve, the maps of the polar regions would be a great deal more cluttered than they are now. Arctic explorer Commander Robert Peary claimed to be the first to reach the North Pole. On his journey there in 1906, he thought he sighted an undiscovered island in the Arctic Ocean. He named it Crocoland and marked it on his map. Now, that sighting was subsequently investigated by another American explorer called Macmillan, who went to look for it in 1914. He did not find it, although he could see it um, when he began his journey. And this, this book, which is essentially the, uh, the, the reminiscences of Macmillan, shows Crocoland, a big question mark on it. It was never found. And indeed, what we can say now, from what we know about the geography of the Arctic, is that the nearest land in the direction in which these chaps were looking is in Siberia, 2,000 kilometers away. At the other end of the Earth, the Antarctic has its own elusive lands. One of the earliest recorded was Pepys Island, which was originally recorded in the late 17th century down here somewhere between the Falkland Islands and the coast of South America. It's not there at all. It's, a, it's another of these fictitious islands. And Sir Joseph Banks, who sailed with Captain Cook in the Endeavour, gives a description in his journal of their attempts to find it. They saw it all right, but when they sailed for it and, uh, and, tr and tried to locate it properly, it disappeared. But Sir Joseph Banks had not been mistaken. The lands he, Peary and Macmillan reported had a scientific explanation. They were mirages. This land behind a lighthouse in Finland is not really there. It's a complicated mirage called a Fata Morgana. A Fata Morgana is a special kind of mirage. As well as lifting the image up and magnifying it, it also involves a lot of stretching, so there's a lot of distortion. It becomes an unrecognizable shape. For example, the edge of an ice floe will become stretched out and look like very tall, thin, columns of ice, like a, a, a crystal cage. These don't look like anything every day. They look like something from fairy tales. So what the explorers reported was real, but distorted and out of position. The lands did not exist where they were seen. We might imagine that as soon as somebody has sailed over the site of a fictitious island and proved that it isn't there, it comes off the chart. This isn't always true. And I can show you one example of this in the case of Swain's Island, which is here, near Antarctica. This has been known for decades to be a bogus island, a fictitious or illusory island. It's still here on the map. Mirages obviously can't account for many of these reports. Buildings can't appear and disappear. So what's the explanation? I suspect the answer must lie in the observer's mind. It's easy to be fooled, especially in unfamiliar surroundings, and to misinterpret what you actually see. Something similar once happened to me. I used to commute by train to my home in North London. One evening, when I thought I'd reached my destination, 
I suddenly realized that my surroundings were totally unfamiliar. Even 50 years later, I can still recall the shock of unrecognition. Of course, in this case, I quickly realized what had happened. I'd simply gotten onto the wrong train. How much more disorientating it must be to know you've seen a building, but never to be able to find it. Thank <music> you.